Paco Garcia. I'm from GMS Magazine and the organizer of the panel. And with me, I have the absolutely wonderful Sarah Newton um, from Mindjammer Press. Uh, if you look in the program, we were meant to be having as well Jenny Blendell from Paizo. Um, unfortunately, I believe that her playing is in the morning to go back home, so she's not been able to make it, which is um, quite annoying and disappointing, and I'm really, really sorry about that. Uh, other than that, we're basically just going to have a chat about the past, the present, and the future of role-playing games. And since this is a fairly small and, and, and obviously very dedicated crowd, uh, we would like to actually bring you guys in uh, and, and get your thoughts as well uh, as to what you think is going to happen in, in the future of role-playing games. Because I, I personally feel that we, we have an awful lot to look forward to in the next five to ten years. And it's quite interesting if we look at, I mean, I don't think, I'm going to start with something controversial. We are not going to have another golden age of, of role-playing games, whatever it is that people mean with the golden age. I, I don't think, looking back, I don't think we're going to have another stock market floated TSR company with 250 or 300 employees and releasing however many books and games they were releasing in the late 80s. Um, I think we're already in a golden age, though. I think right now, for, for role-playing games, we're in, a, we're in an era where people can churn out or push out games so easily. That there are so many, so many different um, ideas floating out, so many different concepts out there. But it is a golden age. I was at the Leisure Games Store this morning, um, just picking up a copy of the Fate Freeport Companion, which is a, a cool little supplement. And there were just crates and crates and crates mm -hmm. of different game supplements. And it reminded me back of, um, like in the early 80s, I used to hang out in um, a games workshop in John Dalton Street in Manchester before they became a, an, a house company. And they used to have cardboard boxes under the shelves sort of full <coughs> of ancient treasures that you could leave through. Mm. And it felt like that at Leisure Games this morning. And these, are all, these aren't old games. These okay. are all new games being published now. Okay, let, let's define in that case what a golden age mm. uh, people understand as, as a golden age. I mean, from, from my point of view, the gold, for, for me, the golden age is the, the time of the big companies, the big business. Yeah, I think mm. publishing in general, though, yes. is, is facing that these days. Mm -hmm. I think there's a huge democratization of publishing, not just role playing games, but if you write fiction or even if you just do art or whatever kind of creativity you're into, it's much easier to, to push things out there these days. So. I think a lot of big companies, in, in some respects, are fading into the background. Even with music, you know, it's so easy to publish these days. Yes. So I don't think you can define a golden age necessarily in terms of enormous companies dominating a market. No, but it's but the interesting thing is that when we look back, mm. I mean, I'm considering that I, I grew up in a different country where role, role playing games in Spain in in the 80s were they were niche. They they were like insanely rare. And it wasn't until the late 80s when things really exploded with Forgotten Realms and, and we began to, to find games. So we, when we looked at it, from, from our point of view, TSR was like, oh, holy cow, really? And then in Gen Con was like this dream space that it was completely unobtainable for us. So when we... When Personally, when I look back as a golden age, it, it is this memory of, yeah, oh my God, look at what they were doing. Look at how amazing it was. And there was a different wave of innovation that I am not seeing these days so much with role-playing games in, in the sense of the format that the, the games came through. We are not seeing anything like, for example, a uh, very, very dear to me, set in Dark Sun, the way that adventures were formatted from the product point of view. Mm -hmm. Have you guys... Do you mean having boxes or...? Well, having the boxes was one thing, which I understand is extremely expensive to do, and therefore not many companies can actually, and games can either afford to do it or, or are suitable for it. Mm -hmm. But I'm sorry, I don't know what you guys think, the, the audience, but for, for us, Boxes were magical. Yeah, they were. They were. It was it's that. Like, it's like you're opening up a treasure chest. Exactly. You know, and you think, I've got to get to see what's in it. Nowadays, all the books, mm. go to stop, we'll leave through that. You go, well, that's nice. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think from a, from a game publisher's point of view, um, there's, a, there's a VAT issue. As soon, yeah, as, soon as you make it into a box, <coughs> then it's 20% more expensive. <laughs> So that, that's the one big Absolutely. And I'm, 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 don't get me wrong, I, I know, because I, I've known you for many years, okay. and, and I've, I know an awful lot of the, of the publisher, and I understand that it, it has to be this. For the time being. For the time being, yeah. it, it has to be. That's a compelling reason why. Absolutely. Not. It has to be. I think in, it's also interesting to think in terms of numbers. I mean, we talk about, I, th I do think we're in a golden age, but things are changing so quickly. Um, you look at the numbers of, of books being sold and printed these days in role-playing game terms, and um, for unless you're one of the big three like Pathfinder or um, you've got Fantasy Flight, or White Wolf, and obviously you've got um, Watsi, um, who are printing many, many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of, of numbers. Um, most role-playing games would be very, very happy if they if they sold 5,000 copies these days. Um, and back in the 80s, um, even relatively niche companies. If you remember FGU doing chivalry and sorcery and mm. things like that, I, I read recently that chivalry and sorcery printed um, something like 20,000 copies of its Saurian supplement, which was really quite an obscure supplement, you know, it was, um, but they, they managed to sell, they, could, they mm. could conceive of selling that many numbers, so I think we've got a much bigger market, there's so many more titles out there now, but the numbers themselves are relatively small, um, which means it's quite easy for people to get into if you want to write your own games. Um, but much more difficult to actually sell a great deal of a single, single product. Exactly, yeah. which is again why I don't feel, uh, in terms of quantity, and, and to be honest, in, even in fear of quality, we may be in some sort of golden age in terms of sales and, and in terms of actually companies surviving and people being able to come out with products that stand out. Mm. Uh-uh. Because all the new games sort of follow the same formula. Every every new game, is, there's so many of them. Mm -hmm. it's, more choice doesn't equal better quality, it just means more choice. Absolutely. And every game that I, this is the first time I've come to a game convention and not bought a thing. Because they're all the same. And, and I, I hopefully, no offence to anybody that makes anything, they're all beautiful. Those books you have on the table there are beautiful, but people collect them, they don't use them. Okay. I, you I, get that, and I promise you'll use that. Oh, well, <laughs> Trust me. Yeah, Trust I mean, me on that one. Well, I don't think, I don't personally, I wouldn't, you see, because it's a really big book, there's a load of information in it. I prefer, but personally, mm -hmm. and you were talking about adventures, I don't see many adventures out there. I see lots of supplements, but I don't see any adventures. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything you can play. I see things that you can spend a lot of money on yep. and collect, and people will stack, stack a book like this. Mm -hmm. You never play that, that many books. Whereas my personal advice is something like Call of Cthulhu, where there's loads of adventures. There's lots of source books as well, obviously. But I don't care about the source books. I want to play a game. I don't want to collect a, a work of art. If I want to collect a work of art, I'll go to a gallery. And that's what I think these books are. I think they're works of art. And I think people collect them like the card game situation. People buy thousands of cards. Do they ever play them? Sometimes. But they're collecting them. They're not playing a game. They're, they're, the game is to get as much as they possibly can. I think I think um, you've got a very good point in that um, the the age group of people playing role playing games has, has steadily increased. Thankfully, there are younger people coming into the hobby all the time, which is great. Um, but people with a less time on their hands, less ability to to create um, regular gaming groups, and a higher disposable income tends to mean people do enjoy buying games to read as well as to play. Um, so that's a f definitely a factor in how people produce games. But I'm definitely with you as well on the um, scenarios, what, what I like to do. Um, I don't like to have huge amounts of games on my shelf. I, I tend to have a handful of games that I, I play regularly, a handful of preferred systems. And I do like to have scenarios, supplements, not huge amounts of rule supplements, but just sort of maybe culture or source books, that kind of stuff, but, but also adventures. And I think the PDF market is really helping us in that respect because it's not, at the moment, very financially viable to, to print and sell mm. adventures like we used to in the 80s. If you remember the old um, modules like G1 and A1 and, and GDQ and all those kind of things, those, those products shifted hundreds of thousands of, of, of units and, and that's a, an enormous economy of scale, whereas mm. now, um, it's even with things like Lulu, it becomes impractical yeah. um, to, to print small adventures because you can't charge enough to, to cover your costs. Yeah, 
So PDFs are really helpful in that respect. But studying like um, adventures, not five or more, all of us here could probably name adventures in the past mm -hmm. that even now you say it, Shadows of Yogg Sothoth, the mm -hmm. Mask and Isle Architect, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the Warhammer one, the Death on the Reich. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that, and people of a certain age get that misty look. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was an event. Mm -hmm. If you weren't that, that was an event. You played it, it was an event. Mm -hmm. I don't really see that a lot these days. I think, yeah. I mean, I know personally, I'm, I'm trying to, to write that kind of. I'd yeah, love to write well, uh, a Borderlands or a Griffin Mountain. Back, back yeah. the mm -hmm. One of the things, they've been World War II. Mm -hmm. Also, you've got the campaign books coming out, yes. the adventure books, mm -hmm. and it's like sparking that. Mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't introduce ourselves, did we? I'm just suddenly sorry to interrupt you there, because you're just mentioning stuff that I'm. My, my name is Sarah Newton. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm a very I'm experienced a, host, obviously. <laughs> just quickly say who I am. <laughs> Um, I, I work for Modifius and Mindjammer Press, and um, I've written, um, I write fiction and role-playing games. Um, and in role-playing games, um, I'm currently working on Achtung Cthulhu, um, writing the, the Zero Point campaign. Um, and I've just released Mindjammer, the role-playing game, which is sort of Ian Banks, the role-playing game, Far Future, <laughs> Transhuman Space Opera, and also Monster Magic, which is a, um, an, a, a modern-style role-playing game which you can use to rejuvenate and replay your old AD&D modules and things like that. It's a new rule set for playing your old um, legacy scenarios like, like GDQ and things like that. So, sorry, I just thought I'd quickly mention that so you know who was talking. But, you know, I think there's got to be something like that mm. that gets this generation of role yeah. players to go, cool, wow, in 10, 20 years' time, mm. they get misty eyes like we do on the old scenarios. Mm. You know, Quickly, Dean Webb those sort of things. Absolutely. Even now, though, you don't see it. No, I'm sorry, but you look around. Most of us are quite old. So when we look back, we've seen it all. We've seen that first venture that grabbed you, whether it's A1, whether it's B1, and you know, for me, it's Cave to Chaos, because that's one of my favorites. I still I still run that today for new yes. groups, so they have the experience, yes. same experience, but never plays the same. So. You know, when you're looking at about the TSR was out, you remember going to the, your store. Everyone has that store they remember going to in the first books. For all we know, those adventures exist now for the new kids. Yeah. But they don't have the, the ability to go back and look at it in five, ten years. So five, ten years, it may be some of these new books, you know, the Fate modules, you know, right. Luminaria, Absolutely. whatever it is. Absolutely. But I think that's a lot of it's got to do with age. And that's, you're, you're, you're co absolutely, you're, you're completely right. And, and the other thing, I'm, I'm going to go to you, sir, you, you were raising your hand. But the, the, the other point that I wanted to is that we are looking at that from the point of view of people who are being into gaming. I mean, who's been into gaming for more than 20 years? You've been there, you've done that. To surprise you, to grab your imagination, is going to be a lot more difficult today than it was 20 years ago when you were a teenager. And, and therefore, to get that sort of adventures produced that can surprise and enthrall you as an experienced, not just as experienced gamer, but as experienced person with a life behind you, is a lot more difficult than to grab somebody who is 15 years old or 16 years old who's got the most amazing imagination that's being fueled with this maddening amount of fantasy that for also, us, we've been 20 years reading it. I think also that the, the quality of, this is, this is a difficult one to say, when, back, in the, back in the 70s and 80s, people were working in a very open field that wasn't cluttered with historical you know, monuments to, to role-playing uh, as we are now. And I think a lot of the scenarios that were written then were, were, were very experimental, I and mean, often very, very sandboxy with no definable plot and unbalanced and, and very, very focused on combat and tournament play and so on. And they were great. Um, we went through a period in the 1990s, I think, of having really structured plots in, um, in, in scenario packs. I don't know anybody here plays Space 1889, but I still have all my old Cloud Captains of Mars and all the, uh, the various adventures. They were extremely plotted. Um, almost railroady, um, and I think over the past ten years, we've actually got a really, really high quality of of game writing, and especially scenario writing, which is fueling, um, being fueled by um, cinema, being fueled by video game structures and things like that. And I think a lot of the um, the indie games and 
I mean, this is a Fate Core game. I don't know if anybody here plays or knows Fate Core or the Fate system. Um, it's a very cinematic system, and the, the the quality of the of the writing of scenarios and things, I think, is actually increasing, and it's becoming incre increasingly competitive, mm -hmm. um, and allowing um, GMs and play groups themselves sort of more actively participate in, in creating plot, kind of like we did in the, in the 1980s without the, um, the overarching railroading of the mm -hmm. 1990s. So I think we've kind of come full circle in a way, um, but with much more hindsight and much more experience. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, you would to say something uh, earlier? My point was essentially what you just said. I think um, Shadows or Masks or Then Within, they were definitive campaigns to find what those games were about. People write a system and then this campaign defined what you do when you play Call of Duty, for example, which is Survive Today. So there's the industry that was new finding those things. So I guess you could have the definitive new and era campaign needs to come out to grab those people who picked up a lovely book and said, oh, and then sort of the timing is right. But yeah, it's not the same for in the industry as it was for the whole community mm -hmm. then. Just you, you were. As for nostalgia, is as we are gathering here a bit different for, for, um, from generation to generation, because we started with uh, D and D and Warhammer, and uh, but the guys that are ten years younger, fifteen years younger than me, are the vampire generation, and they have their own mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. great campaigns and the Shadowrun generation that they they tell, tell, tell me about things that uh, since I never got into Shadowrun, mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand them. And they, 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 talk, they talk about those campaigns mm -hmm. in the, in the, with the same misty-eyed look as <laughs> I talk about, uh, about the enemy within or uh, Masks of Nihilato Pep or something like that. So I think every generation will complain mm -hmm. that, oh, why don't they do it like my time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or the, old, the good old days. Yes, the good old days. About scenarios, my friend Umberto Pignatelli, he, he makes a, uh, a, a source book for uh, the Beasts of a Forest Savage Worlds called Beasts and Barbarians. Yeah. That's a, a very good swords and sorcery setting. And he, make, and he makes a huge quantity of adventures. I think they're all excellent. I, I didn't get to play, play them because... But, they are all PDFs, as mm. Sarah put it. Mm. And yes, there are adventures out there for, probably not for the systems we care about, but for, for, for others. There are, there, they, they, uh, probably you, don't, you, you won't find them here, mm. but go to drive through RPG or something like that, and you'll find adventures. One of the models that um, we're going to be using, or we are using at um, mm. the Mind Jammer Press in Modifius, is releasing um, scenario packs. So for example, the Zero Point campaign was also going to be one called Fringe Ops coming out this summer for Mindjammer, um, where we're releasing the individual scenarios as they come out in PDF. Um, and then at the very end of, the, of the, the, the campaign, the campaign itself comes out as a physical volume, uh, which allows us to realistically continue to produce material in small format and then have a single um, large campaign pack in physical format at the end of it. Um, so that seems to be a, a more realistic way of looking at producing um, scenario packs. And also I think it gives us a chance to produce things like um, Death on the Reich and, and, and uh, The Enemy Within and uh, Borderlands and, and those kind of um, big campaign packs, just incrementally releasing them one scenario at a time. So what do you think is going to be the future? What, what, how do you feel the, the landscape of role-playing games will be in the next 10 years? I think, well, the next 10 years, I think, um, is going to be really exciting. It's just starting to kick off now with things like Roll20. Um, I think many of us old RPG gamers spent probably 10 years struggling to find groups in the places where we were living. If you're living in a big city, it's not a problem, but I live in a shack in a field in Normandy, and there is nobody around. Um, plenty of sheep, but nobody who plays role-playing games. So it's really hard to actually get together for a regular group. Um, but online gaming, and not, not video gaming, but actually online tabletop role-playing, I think is going to be really our, our greatest saviour in the next 10 years. You know, the hobby's been ageing and perhaps thinning out geographically, um, and suddenly online gaming lets us overcome that restriction, and we can have 
um, tabletop groups meeting weekly for the most obscure games you can imagine because we're global. Um, and I think that's going to be a really, really powerful thing. Roll 20s there, um, Fantasy Grounds, there are, there are many other. Kluge Works was another good one. I don't know if it's still around or not. Um, I think those kind of experiences are going to become increasingly sophisticated. Um, and also, I think they'll be, as we all are, we all have our preferences of how, how virtual or how tactile we want to be. Um, I think there'll be telepresence um, tabletop gaming um, for those people who want that kind of thing. And, and can afford it. And can afford <laughs> it and have big enough bandwidth and that kind of stuff. But I think also there'll be very, very basic, almost you know, more sophisticated versions of Roll20, mm -hmm. um, where you're just at your computer or at your tablet or on your television um, playing with people around the world and using dice rollers and so on. So I think for the next 10 years, that's going to be the, the growth area. And I think the challenge is to um, be able to provide support material to enable that. So at the moment, it's fairly straightforward. When you produce a scenario, um, you can provide um, a support pack for people of things like digitized maps, um, perhaps um, handy um, summaries of stat blocks or, or, or locations and things that people can simply copy and paste into their favorite online tabletop system. Um, but I think that's going to become um, increasingly sophisticated, sophisticated and, and I think that's where um, we're going to find a bit of a challenge working out how to do it because it does take time. Um, and at the moment it's expected that that will be free. Mm. Um, so you have to sort of balance the quality that people will demand with what people are prepared to pay for that extra functionality to announce to be produced I online. You have to reduce so. the quantity that that's in that because <laughs> yeah. I work for VMware and we what you're talking about in terms of telepresence, we've got some new things coming mm. which I can't talk about. But I mean which are are incredible when it comes to not tabletop gaming, but I can easily see how you would do it in tabletop yeah. gaming. Yeah. But it's all about finding information quickly when you're doing things like that. So when we do, when we look at how mobility works and mobiles work, mm. and how you get information to those devices quickly mm. in a way that people see it, it's it's sorry to sound technical, it's about indexing. Yeah. It's about finding stuff. Now, again, a book like that is amazing. But you put that on a computer and try and find something, it takes the GM ten minutes to find it on a computer, especially. That's why we buy books. So, I mean, as much as PDFs are brilliant and all that, mm -hmm. and all that, we end up printing them out and then still yeah. looking through. Mm -hmm. We have to find information quickly. So games have to change in terms of their mechanics a little mm -hmm. bit to allow that to happen. So mechanics on one page or, or a resistance table appears right now and then you use it for everything. Mm -hmm. So you, you haven't got people all over the world. Because I think that's the way it's going to go. Yeah. Hopefully it will go that way. I mean, I think, I think games like Fake Core um, are a good example of an mm -hmm. evolution because once you actually know the rules, you don't need to use the rule book yeah. during play. Um, and I think that's really, really important for yeah, online absolutely. gaming. You do not want to be sat there flicking through even a physical book when you're online because it takes you out of the immersion if you're in, a, in an online environment. Um, so I think that's, that's going to be key is making... I think you're completely right. PDFs will be superseded by some other standard or at least unpackable into some kind of um, oh, yes. mm -hmm. um, you know, standard that we can plug into these tabletops. Yes. And I think that's something we still have to, you know, yeah. still being born right now. Isn't Absolutely. It? Yeah. It, it is, it's just a matter of fact. You have a point to make there. Um, I'm from Sweden and I organize conventions there, both gaming conventions and Japanese conventions. Mm -hmm. And in the Japan convention, it's a much younger crowd. Um, and there, we have most success with game role-playing games, like small role-playing games, like indie games, or a version of role-playing games which like incorporates the cosplay or does such things. Um, is there a way to capture the next generation into a role-playing game through this? They won't read this like big, mm. you know, they want fast. Sure, and I, I think there is. I think one of the um, the things that. Um, Roll20 does to some extent, but increasingly the, the online tabletop gaming is going to do is have modules where the rules are actually plugged into the module. Oh, yes. um, and as you get more sophistication, I think cosplayers are going to have a great time um, with, the, with the, the, the avatars that are going to be possible with, mm. with um, online gaming. And I think we were talking, Paco initially talked about the next 10 years, and I think that's going to be dominated by by extensions of the tabletop into the virtual space. Mm -hmm. But what's going to be really exciting is sort of the, maybe the 10 years after that, when you're looking at 
um, role playing actually going merging with LARPing to some extent where you don't actually have to get physically dressed up but you're actually playing avatars in an environment which may or may not be GM moderated and I think you know how many of you how many of us as are GMs here yeah would you would you like to give up GMing to become a player in a virtual world or would you like to have your own virtual world that you could GM in yes, well, uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So if you if you could have a virtual world in which you could be the GM, that's that's cool, isn't it? Yeah. Just doing way you play. You might do an MMO. Yeah, and I think that's that's where the sweet spot's going to be is when you can actually easily manipulate a virtual environment um, in a in a sort of role playing game context, and I think that's quite a way away. Another one, Avatar would put me off because I'd like to see. What the person looks like mm -hmm. when I'm gaming with them. I don't look at computer screens mm. oh, and I've pixelated orc. Mm -hmm. I'd to see, say, yourselves mm -hmm. looking at you as a person, mm -hmm. and I think we get more out of that than we're just looking at the computer. I think, I think, um, but I don't know if it's true anymore. The younger crowd, they're used to, you know, I play World of Warcraft a lot, and I've got a lot of younger friends that play it too. I've never met, but I still consider yeah. friends. Yeah. Right? We get it with tweet, Twitter. Right? How many people that I've met today and yesterday just that I've never met in person? Mm. You know, as an older, you know, we, we're older, we're not used to that. But the younger crowds are used to that. Mm. Yeah. Then there are certain people they would never recognize, but they, you show them the picture of who they are, mm. whether it's from whatever game or Twitter, where they're like, oh, you're such and such. Yeah. Well, and I, so I think that's what one thing the game companies have to do is at some level stop going to the old crowd. Yeah. Because yeah. we're going to stop playing, you know, we're going to eventually go away and you have to start embracing the new people, yeah. which is hard to do because they're, they're younger, they don't have the disposable income that we have, you know, you know, but they've got all the time in the world. Yes. You know, you know, you <laughs> there, yeah. there, there are several, several things about that. Um, firstly, I'm, 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 this is, I, I am a purist and a, I am unashamedly so. I, we have one of my players on my Wednesday group who moved um, to York a few months ago, and we have him on the, the pad, on my tablet, playing. We have tried having two people when he couldn't make it. We hated it. Having one person was fine because we miss him, we want to, as soon as we have more than one and we are, we're losing out on that physical presence, mm -hmm. my group just absolutely hates it. We, we really don't like it at all. So I, for, I, I can see where you, where you try and what you, you think is going, mm. I wonder how, or maybe there's something that you cannot talk about, how that teleconference and that telepresence, how is it going to make up for the nuances of physical presence, which is, from my point of view, what really makes role-playing games stand aside from any other, I used it, to play it, them it's not, it's not to do with role-playing, it's to do, I completely agree, yeah. it's to do with a, a different generation, and it's to do with the, I mean, when I make a phone call now, I use whatever video standard I use, uh, or, or when I use Twitter or whatever. Most of the time when I communicate with people now, they don't ever see me. If I need to talk to somebody in America, no. then I won't fly to America, I'll put them onto a video call, or, or Japan. Or oh no, I, I, I understand that. And that's, it, as we grow up, and we get jobs, or hopefully get jobs, or get married, or, or whatever, we, um, un unfortunately, society pushes us away from each other for different reasons. And because we get pushed away, I mean, um, my friend and I, we, we've known each other for many years, but we live separately. Mm -hmm. So we can't play games together anymore unless we make a, a massive effort to drive 50 or 100 miles or something. I just think in terms, we've got to make it a better experience for people. But that is how I wonder how it's going to happen. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 again, I'm, I'm, I'm very much of a purist from the communication mm -hmm. point of view. And as of today, and I think this is going to take quite some time, mm -hmm. I don't believe that you can replace face-to-face -face communication with any other means of communication. Mm -hmm. Something is always lost. Yes. Always. Yeah. Do you remember when Facebook came out? What yes. year it was? Uh, 2006 or 2007. It's no time at all, is it? No. And yet it's embedded deeply. I, I, have a, mm. I met a friend last night, and this gentleman was saying, I've never ever met him in the flesh before. I've known him for two or three years. Um, you know, we, we, we've written together, we've worked together. He's a friend. I know him. Um, 
and I'd never ever met him physically. I mean, we were just laughing together as though we'd actually physically known one another for three years that we'd never met before. And that was not possible 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, things are going to change rapidly. And I, I think your question was, you know, how is, how is technology going to make up for those nuances? I think it just will. And people will adjust. People are social animals. And, and, I, and I think we will just jump in there and do it. That gentleman wants to make a point. So I want to say just about there, but I've already stepped around the internet. But the last six months we've been playing on Google Hangouts, and I really don't notice the it being any different from sitting around the table, really. We yeah. will visit your spaces, we will have a lack of. Once your like, headspace adjusts, then you're yeah, there, right? Yeah, it, it, just, it just seems now. And when we play late games like Fate, but we don't need to we don't play politician DD on Hangouts, is it? Okay, let, let me let me let me put you in like, an extreme situation. Let, let me let me ask you this: If you had to choose for the rest of your life to play the same frequency, face to face or Google Hangouts, which one would you go for? Um, face to face, because it's something that the type of game you play. Exactly. There is. We are human, and yes, mm -hmm. technology is changing that, and technology is is breaking some barriers that we we have had there for a bit. But we are social animals. We are social animals. If there is a way, and, and again, this is just my perception from the point of view of, of, of having played the games and, and being a psychotherapist and being, having face-to-face -face contact with, with clients in a lot of difficult environments. Given the choice, humans want to be with humans at this level, at a physical level, they, we, we want to, there are aspects of communication that I genuinely don't believe today, I don't know in 15 years, 20 years, I don't think in 10 years time, today, technology cannot bridge. And, and yes, the, 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 the frame mind can limit oneself to say, right, we are playing the game, and therefore, this is what my mind is thinking about, this is where I am at the moment, mm. but we are compartmentalizing that. We, we are leaving aside an awful lot of the stuff that we don't realize we're doing when we are face to face. But I think, I think we're, we're missing that. You're missing that. Yeah. We wait for people to show up to play the game, talking about their life, you're talking about what's happening. You're taking the break for the tea or the smoke. Exactly. That's, we go in and out. Yeah. So we go in and out. That's what you know, the Google you know, Hangouts and everything else really brings. You focus on the game, but you miss, it's not, as weird as it sounds from the role playing games, you miss the social interaction. You focus so much on the game, you don't get that just bullshit. We used to be bad. We'd stop the game at 10 o'clock and be 11 o'clock before people leave the host. You know, yeah. you're standing in front of you're standing at the doorway mm -hmm. talking. But I think that I think that will come just eventually. Yeah, so, I, mean, just I, I, I have this bizarre, bizarre imagination of um, sitting in a virtual world outside the dungeon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's monsters and there's mayhem and we're all tooled up and we're all wielding our spells and stuff. I'm just saying, so how does work this week? Right. You know, Joseph and then the lady behind. behind. Joseph, what, what about in the other in the other direction? I mm -hmm. mean, I've see, I see in Kickstarter and announced everywhere a lot of tools to bring to the to the gaming table, electronic tools. Uh, uh, I mean, there. I I I think I saw sites. Uh, 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 a simulated tabletop to be used on on uh, on tablets. Mm -hmm. uh, why not, like, uh, like you said, probably uh, an, ind an, ind uh, an indexing program that can get the rules at the, at the touch of a point, or uh, uh, one that uh, gets that to any everybody's tablet, for instance, so, so that we can consult the rules in a, in a, in a moment's notice. Okay. A lot of things that can, uh, I believe, that are coming out that are going to help the tabletop experience. Yeah. Ex uh, There's no doubt, no doubt. Okay. Outside of uh, the internet or uh, no doubt. Th those tools, those tools exist yes. to, to a point. I mean, Microsoft have been working. They've got a place called Research Labs in Seattle, and they've got a, they've got something like that mm -hmm. where you you, uh, and it's it's a case now of buying uh, a small projector and just pointing it down at the table, and the computer picks up where your hand is. And then the rules are not written down. You don't get a table that you roll on. The, the, the situation is that if you know where you are on the table, you can say, now, the, the problem with that makes it sound like a war game. Yeah? And tabletop role-playing, when you're doing it in virtual space, 
feels more like a war game because all of a sudden you're back into miniatures and yeah. you move this yes, much and you do one, that. That's one part of it, but another like playing like fight in which uh, you you may not use anything, but maybe you can get the. Uh, I mean, I've seen a project of dice that you could roll and. When they when they got their results, the the, the results were transmitted to everybody's tablet. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Everybody's tablet. Hmm. Everybody knew the role at the same time. You have a look. There's but a, 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 that a, didn't take away the pleasure of no, rolling that. There's, there's a yeah. product called Leap Motion, mm -hmm. which is uh, like Connect. You know, we've got an Xbox. It's a bit like Connect, but it's for a computer. At 25, 30 pounds, and you plug it into a USB port on your computer, and it sees your hands in real space. And there's a program where if you, for example hold your hand over, cup your hand like that, and do this, then some virtual dice roll out. Yeah, and they roll across the table. Okay. Um, so, I, I would like to spread a little bit of the conversation. The, the young woman over there has wanted to make a point, and there's a gentleman over there who's been with his hand raised for quite some time. So please, uh, let's uh, go to you. No, uh, basically, I would consider myself uh, as part of the younger generation of uh, role-playing gamers. Um, so for me, do, do I like the social element of face-to-face gaming, um, yes. Do I think it will be replaced by technology? No, I don't think anything will replace it because at the core, that's part of the game. I mean, the whole idea of getting together on a night, you know, getting your snacks in and, you know, seeing your friends after a hard, you know, week at work, that, that's the whole point and you have catch-ups in between. I like that, but for me personally, if it wasn't the technology, I wouldn't really get a chance to play at all. Mm -hmm. So if it's a choice of not playing or using technology where I you know, don't get the same sort of um, social interactivity of maybe being there with you know, people in physical um, being, then yeah, of course I'm going to choose the technology side of Absolutely. it. Um, and you know, again, I think it's something that you know, my friend uh, Shane commented on that we do have to embrace it because if we don't embrace it, then you know we're missing out. Mm. Really, agreed. Definitely. And it's also going to be a massive spur to the development and growth of the industry going Absolutely. forward as well. I mean, we are going to be more physically dispersed. So. Definitely. Yeah. You over there have been wanted to say something for a while now. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, when you mentioned um, um, online and um, customizable virtual worlds with um, avatars and so on. I think, I think that's already happened. Um, I mean, I don't know if anybody's, if anybody's heard of um, Neverwinter Nights. Oh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, that's been, I mean, well, not that really, that was like some of the early, early 2000s. 1999, more or less, uh, wasn't well, it? That's, that's, yeah. that's still played, that's still being sold. Yeah. Um, like, <coughs> you, you're online, you can log into hundreds of different um, private servers being run and download dozens of different ventures that people have made for it. But you're, you're not actually acting as game master in Neverwinter well, Nights, yeah, are you? The there is the, uh, you yeah, see, I'm... You, uh, can, you can get scenarios in which they are built for up to four to six players and a person who is put in the position of game master who can then manipulate the world as you described. Okay, I didn't realise that, that's it. I think it's only a matter of time until someone, until someone remembers that and realises, oh, that was a good idea. We should do that again. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. Look into that, yeah. Well, we, we have 10 minutes left. And in, in terms of the future, I, I will also talk about what the future of the industry as, as companies is going to be like. We, we, I, th I think we figured out that technology is going to play a massive part, mm. but we love each other and we want to be in the same room if we can help it. Yeah. I think that's pretty much the gist yeah. of it. Um, it, it kind of. What's going to happen to the industry? Because I think we are very much at a very, very interesting point mm. um, for many reasons. Um, Firstly, another of my blunt statements, I think the future kind of belongs to Paizo. Okay. <laughs> that in terms of their model, the way that they are doing things, I think they've nailed it. I think the D&D announcement that the basic set is going to be free... Ah, that is what's is, going to rock things up really a lot. rock things, I think, that's in the that's, that's, Now, that's going to be interesting. And I'm, 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 not, I'm not adventuring any predictions on that one because I don't know what the OGL is going to be like, what the licensing agreement is going to be like. That's not out until next, next year, I don't think. Exactly. Yeah. And since that is what really screwed 4th edition up, hmm. big time, um, I'm a bit reluctant to think, well, is, is D&D going to be able to come back to what it used to be? 
And I would be very surprised because I feel the formula that Paizo is doing should be replicated time and time and time and time again, based on two things, or three things, that are absolutely key and touch of genius. One is that you can get so much stuff for free. So much stuff. Now I think 99% of the product they do is actually freely available and you can do with it whatever you want. You're immediately infiltrating groups of gamers by stealth, by freedom sort of thing. Secondly, the Pathfinder Society is amazing. I mean, that is just amazing. The fact that they are telling you, you know what, you want to play Pathfinder? You don't need anything. You just join the Pathfinder Society and you're going to get groups of people that you can join and you're going to get your adventures and if you help us you're going to get your exclusive material and we're going to give you things ahead of everybody else. Mm -hmm. That has built an absolutely amazing community, yeah. amazing yeah. community, which I feel is what's been lacking in role playing games for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, and this is the most difficult thing to replicate, the adventure path. To be able to give you every month, I mean, I don't know if any of you have been collecting the Adventure Pass. I, I saw the first one and immediately subscribed. I've been getting them every single one since. Every single month you get for $13 or $14 mm -hmm. a perfect bound, beautifully illustrated, gorgeous to look at adventure mm -hmm. that they are, every single one of them are absolutely outstanding quality. I mean, if people out here, if you're into Pathfinder, if you haven't played uh, The Rise of the Room Lords, which is the first one they produced, seriously, you're missing out. It's tremendous. Mm -hmm. And I reckon that that formula is going to work for Paizo for a generation easily. Yeah. I think um, if you ask most people out there, have they heard of Pathfinder? Um, most people will say no. And most, you yeah, I think if you, if, you, if you go into the wide world and say, you know, what's Pathfinder? Mm -hmm. um, they're going to come up with the name of a car. Most of them are not going to think of a role-playing game. Is there a car called Pathfinder? I think... Okay. <laughs> so, 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 I'm not into cars. <laughs> um, whereas if you go to most people on the street and say, have you heard of Dungeons and Dragons? they'll think, yeah, that's the role-playing thing. Um, and I think that degree of brand recognition is something that's really, really difficult to overcome for any RPG company. And I think Pathfinder have done a, a great job of, um, of fixing the, um, the, the move away from the mm -hmm. third edition um, OGL game that um, Watsi tried to do with fourth edition. Yeah. And they've, they've very neatly stepped into the vacuum that Watsi inadvertently created. Um, but I don't think that it's by any means game over. Um, no, 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 I don't and, think so either. I think, I think, um, I think there's, publishing is, is facing a really challenging era at the moment. Uh, we've all watched DVDs in the UK where you put your DVD in the machine and the first thing you see is this terribly sinister warning saying you wouldn't steal a car. Um, however, if you could take that car and leave an identical copy in its place and have that car in your home, then would that be stealing? And, and it's well, only that's the whole debate of together, isn't it? That's the whole debate. Yeah. And so we're in an era at the moment where it's not very clear exactly what property means in mm. that context. And I don't think anybody, I mean, as a, as a game designer, it, take, it took me a year to write this. Um, and that's, you know, a year's income from a game is very, very hard to produce. Mm. And, you know, we, we write for very low amounts in the RPG industry. And the fact that it's possible to take a, a digital version of that and leave the original in its place um, is something that our economy hasn't really worked out how to deal mm -hmm. with yet. And I think that's still something that's very much up in the air. Um, and I think D&D &D with its, you know, the basic set is free, might be throwing down the gauntlet um, and trying to create a model where, you know, the PDFs are something which is going out. It's clear that, you know, I think D&D &D are going to be trying to make their money perhaps off social networks, mm -hmm perhaps of scenario paths, perhaps of value adds, which may be digital. We're talking to the future. Yeah. They're based and go, oh, give this free to the yeah. free stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But you probably don't get a lot of players at all, free stuff, new players, younger players, mm. simple free. So you're looking, not in 10 years' time, 20, 30, getting what we are 
some say 20, 30 year mm, yeah. veterans if you like, they're going to start that with that I think. Mm. They're looking long, long term. It's like a subscription model. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we, we're, we're the generation where we buy things and we hoard it away, mm. whereas if, for example, I pay $15 a month or £15, £10 a month to log into MindJam, mm. and I knew that there was going to be something new there every month, but it was still a game that I'm running and, and yeah. things like that, that sounds much more appealing to me. I'm not saying it being virtual, mm. but those things are there. And maybe the fact that they're only there for maybe two or three months mm. makes it even more um, mm. something I want to do, because then the world's moving at the same time, same with Pathfinder. Mm. If, it, if it's moving all the time and it's gone, once it's gone, it's gone. Mm. Maybe. I'm in that and I can do it at that time. So I will pay you $10 a month to beat, uh, and with the guarantee that you're going to do something for sure. it. And then I do, and if I don't do it, I've missed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like Spotify or something like that. And I think that's where Kickstarter, Kickstarter started making that new mm -hmm. furrow, the Patreon model, where you, yeah. where you, it actually is a, a, sub, a subscription model, yeah. is proving very successful at the moment. Yeah. And I think those, those are sort of surprise factors, unknown factors mm -hmm. in the mix, which I don't think necessarily a the the Paizo model. I mean, they could they could actually subvert oh, the Paizo model. But they also have to now people getting to know the developers. Again, when we were first starting out, there was TSR. Mm -hmm. You didn't look at who the author was, unless it was Guy yeah. 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 But other than that, you didn't really notice, you know, not against Monty Cook, when he first started doing stuff, you probably didn't look at No, Monty you're right, Cook's you're name, right. right. We didn't care. But now, you know who the developers are. Mm. And I think that's one way I think the publishers, the small companies, can make their money. Mm. Because by coming, you're a person. Hmm. You know, two, two people, you know, two people. So as far as we it's know. Harder for us, <laughs> it's harder for people to steal. I, mean, I, I think it's just taking the pirate copies. I don't, like, I might do it to review it, but then I'll try to pay the money for it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if I don't like it, I put it aside and I don't go back to it. Mm -hmm. And it's like doing that, that's I think how the smaller publishers keep going by making it. You're, you're a person, you're somebody, yes. and it's almost a patronage. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman there wants to make a point, he's been hanging his hand up for a while. Yeah, I, I think it's quite a sensible move, because what they're effectively doing is aping the free-to-play model that mm -hmm. kind of video games are doing now, and I think it's actually quite good in the context of growing maybe a younger audience. You don't have that sort of initial disposable income to buy, like, say, a 60 quid source book. Mm. Once you've got it, you play maybe a few games, you've done it for free, mm. then you go off and you get the other kind of, like, secondary stuff. And that's when the kind of money comes in. So I think, in terms of actually trying to generate new interest and new players coming in, I think it's actually quite a shrewd move on their part. Yeah. Yes. Th there's one thing though that I, I still think it could be a massive, massive hindrance for Dungeons and Dragons, Hasbro. The mm -hmm. fact that Wizards of the Coast is owned by a mega company, that the only thing they're interested in is money. If D and D doesn't produce, not just produce money, mm. but the amount of money that they want in order to justify its existence, Dungeons and Dragons <coughs> as a line is going to be seriously jeopardised. I think I, I have no inside information at all, but having seen what happened with Fourth Edition, which I think was run on that basis, mm -hmm. um, the way that Fifth Edition is being handled suggests that they're not going to try that this time round. I am a cynical person and I do not trust mega corporations. <laughs> I definitely don't trust Hasbro and that's on camera. Um, so I, I would, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to hold my breath on that one and just <laughs> wish the guys at Wizards of the Coast the best, best of luck on this one because they are going on near it. Um, we're running off, we have run out of time, which is rather unfortunate, regrettable, but predictable. I thank you everybody very, very much indeed for coming. Um, Sarah is going to be in the Modifius, so by all means do let the conversation continue and um, uh, take a look at Manjama. Trust me on this one, take a look at Manjama, you will not be disappointed. Thank, thank you.